Now, let's go to the panel discussion. We have four distinguished panelists, plus uh, Dr. Galvao, who will join the panel also. I am honored to introduce our panelists uh, this morning. And I will start with uh, Professor Gostin. Uh, we know that Professor Gostin has to leave us at 10, so I will start with you. Uh, Lawrence Gostin is a university professor, Georgetown University highest academic rank and founding O'Neill Chair in Global Health Law. He directs the World Health Organization Center on National and Global Health Law. Professor Gostin is a professor of medicine at Georgetown University and professor of public health at Johns Hopkins University. WHO Director General appointed Professor Gostin to high level positions, including expert panels on the international health regulation and on mental health. He served on the Director General's Advisory Committee on Reforming WHO, as well as WHO Expert Advisory Committee on Pandemic Influenza, Smallpox, Genomic Sequencing, and Migrant Health. He served as WHO Blue Ribbon Panel on Global Health Equity, and he co-chairs the Lancet Commission on Global Health. Um, Dr. Gosti has been uh, had many recognitions and awards, but I only will mention one that called particularly my attention, granted by the UK, the National Consumer Council, best of Professor Gosti with the Rosemary Delbridge Memorial Award for the person, and I quote, who has most influenced parliament and government to act for the welfare of society, end of the quote. So uh, we are delighted to have you, Professor Goldstein, this morning. And um, I would like you to make some comments for the next uh, between five and seven minutes. But uh, I am concerned about the presence of inequalities in the Americas, as all of us are, and this presence of inequality is obscene. And so is the access of health care. Health as a right is not universally recognized. Uh, what can we do as society to make progress on this most important issue? Dr. Rostin, you have the floor. Right, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I just, I think I'm just supposed to speak for about five or seven minutes, if that's correct. Um, the, the, um, even before COVID-19, it seems to me that the most um, important uh, narrative in the world, and certainly in the Americas, was the narrative of vast inequalities. <clears throat> uh, the the um, inequalities were uh, in vast differences in income, um, both within and among countries, um, with the top uh, 1% uh, and even the top 0.1% of the population uh, <clears throat> having enormous wealth, um, and so many are, have been left behind. <clears throat> where now the, the next generation has fewer opportunities than their parents. <clears throat> These things are, have been of enormous consequence. And Martin Luther King um, in the United States once said something very wise among many of the wise things he said, which is that all inequalities are unjust, but the greatest um, injustice are health inequalities. And we've seen those even before COVID in a, in a massive way. And so when COVID arose, um, we like to talk of it saying that we're all in it together, um, that, that it affects everybody. And that's true, um, but it affects uh, the poor, the vulnerable, the elderly much, much more um, than others. If you're young um, and a white um, uh, a collar professional and you can and you can work remotely, uh, you've got plenty of food, plenty of income, 
um, it's not that great a hardship. But if you're unemployed or if you're an essential worker um, uh, and you can't afford your rent um, or to feed your children, um, it's much different for you. As well, um, in many parts of the Americas and the world, um, people of um, minority racial classes like um, black Americans in the United States um, have over four times uh, the death rate from COVID-19 as um, the, the majority white populations. And so we see a circumstance where uh, COVID has really just enhanced the disparities in health um, and as our last speaker pointed out, also driving people into op absolute poverty, food insecurity, um, and many other um, uh, health harms. In fact, most people are not dying from COVID. Most people are dying from uh, everyday diseases, diabetes, uh, heart disease, cardi uh, uh, things like that, uh, cancer, um, and they're and they're they're uh, being they're poor um, and they're insecure. And so the question is is what we can do about it. Um, and the first thing we can do about it is pay attention to equity. Um, that is to have granular data on health outcomes that include um, socioeconomic status, poverty, um, uh, race. Uh, disability and other indicators of disadvantage, and then to have a, a national action plan for equity, um, something that I've proposed in my academic writing. Um, we could even uh, consider something like a framework convention on global health that, that is based upon the right to health and uh, the right to health justice. Um, so. In my work, I, I like to think that there are two separate but interrelated ideas we need to advance. We need to advance health um, with ever improving health outcomes, but we need to do so equitably and fairly and with justice and the rule of law. And we need both. We need health improvement and we need it to be fair and equal. Um, and we need to work on that if that's gonna happen it won't happen by accident. We're going to have to make special efforts as a society um, to monitor, measure, and then respond to uh, vast inequalities, in particular health inequalities in the Americas and then globally. Um, so thank you very much and um, happy to take questions or just um, remain on the line for a little while. And my apologies for having to leave a bit early. Thank you, Professor Gostin. Uh, you have called our attention that there should be national plans for equity. I think this is most important. I agree with you. And I would like, now that we have you online, to make some comments about multilateralism. You know, it has proved to be functioning, at least in the pandemic, with international cooperation and solidarity which are the strengths and challenges multilateralism has when we see also expressions of strong nationalism and closure of borders. And I have another question for you from the audience. Uh, this question is related to WHO. What has been the greatest challenge for WHO when facing governments that have lost credibility in their institutions to the point of withdrawing their financial support. How to face this situation that do not happen in the future? You have the floor, Professor Gostin. Yes, thank you. Um, those are two interrelated questions. Um, you know, I'm the director of the, uh, you know, PAHO WHO um, Collaborating Center on uh, National and Global Health Law. And so um, WHO means a great deal to me, and I've been, uh, I'm in close uh, um, friendship and partnership with both um, uh, PAHO and uh, WHO in Geneva and in its uh, other regional offices and, and country offices. 
Um, WHO is going through um, you know, a dual crisis, of course. It's trying to lead the greatest um, response to a pandemic in our lifetimes. Um, but at the same time, um, countries have disregarded the international health regulations um, uh, in um, myriad ways. Um, and my own country, the United States, um, uh, President Trump has um, announced a, a one-year um, waiting time for us to withdraw from the World Health Organization. Um, I think what President Trump did is one of the most uh, horrific presidential decisions in modern uh, history. But uh, there's an election, as everyone knows, in the United States in the next four weeks. Um, and uh, if, uh, uh, pres if a uh, future president, Biden, were elected, um, he would uh, remove the withdrawal announcement to WHO. So WHO needs um, more stable and sustainable funding from its member states. Um, it needs to have political backing from its member states. And unfortunately, um, we've seen WHO being caught in the middle of a geopolitical struggle between China and the United States. Um, but many countries have been in close solidarity with PAHO um, and WHO um, both. Um, you know, if you look at the, the, the five worst performing countries in the world, um, all of them have nationalistic, populistic leaders. Um, Many of those leaders, not all of them, but many of those leaders um, have um, sidelined and disregarded science and public health um, with the, the, the most glaring example of, of, of anti-science being in the United States of America, I'm sorry to say. Um, and so we need to support our science and our public health agencies. This is a virus that is, you know, formidable. It's highly transmissible. Uh, it's highly pathogenic. Um, and it's, you know, spreading wild, uh, widely across the world. And unless we rely on science, um, and particularly right now, non-pharmaceutical interventions like universal mask use, uh, social distancing, personal hygiene, um, and limitations on gatherings indoors, um, this is going to be uh, get far, far worse. And the vaccine is on the horizon, but the vaccine will not be a magic bullet. It won't have full effectiveness. And there are huge problems of equitably distributing the vaccine um, to every person in the world, irrespective of where they live or um, how much money they earn. Professor Gostin, thank you so much for your comments and most important presence in our panel. Uh, feel free to, to, to remain with us the next nine minutes. We know you have to leave at 10. But now we have Guto around also, uh, Dr. Galvao. Uh, I want you to remain for the whole session, huh? not only uh, immediately. Uh, you, you were our keynote speaker, but please remain to the whole panel. And I have a question for you. Uh, and this question is related to our health systems uh, in, in the world, and particularly in the America. COVID-19 has exposed the stresses and weakness of our health systems. How to make them more resilient for future shocks? Guto, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I will be brief uh, uh, on this. this, this is, uh, I, I am a... a I really believe in two important issues. One is the the outcomes of the Astana uh, meeting, which talk about primary health, and I think the universal access and coverage for health based on primary care is a very important message and is the basic we need to achieve in the region and the world to really uh, prevent or respond better for the next crisis. That is, will come. You see you have now the climate change, so that uh, embedded in this, there are many crises that uh, we can see coming. 
The second is the right to health. So we, I am a, a firm believe to build systems that really deals with the problems of public health, we need to take from the right to health. Um, I come from Brazil, where in our constitution, we have right to health right in there, and uh, we have the unified health system, which has been great responding to the COVID, despite of uh, any, you know, difference with the other uh, intervenients, but has been the basic that the people uh, have and count on to respond for health crisis. And I am firm believe in these two principles, right to health and uh, universal access and coverage to health based on primary health care. Thank you. Thank you, Guto. Uh, we will continue with our panel discussion, and I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Ricardo Cortez Alcalá, who is the Director General of Health Promotion of the Secretary of Health of Mexico. He has played key roles in the health administration of his country. I would like to highlight that Dr. Cortez Alcalá is the creator of Susana Distancia, an inspiring character used for health education in the pandemic as part of the Secretary of Health Strategy for the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would like to invite Dr. Cortez Alcalá to share us his experience in a major urban setting like Mexico City to promote social distance and to communicate with the population. Dr. Cortez Alcalá, we are delighted to have you here. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Zotelo. Thanks a lot for uh, the invitation. Um, I'd uh, like to to say that uh, um, our our risk communication strategy um, it's uh, been a, a, a whole system uh, approach and a team teamwork. Um, Susana Distancia uh, in, in, in English is uh, uh, maintain uh, social distancing, healthy distancing. And uh, it was created as a, a character, as a superhero um, to address uh, uh, children, especially. Uh, we think that uh, um, getting uh, kids' uh, attention um, will help everyone to understand um, what are the, the needs uh, uh, and uh, kids will help us to um, educate uh, adults and educate their parents, their grandparents, and uh, as you may know, uh, all may know, um, our social composition in Mexico is quite complex as uh, in other Latin American uh, countries. When, where we uh, live uh, uh, with our grandparents and uh, we take care of our parents when they uh, get, uh, grow older. And uh, sometimes our older, our parents still take care of us um, as uh, adults and our kids, uh, their grandchildren. So um, what, we, what we've learned uh, from the pandemic is that we need to, to be uh, open, we need to be transparent, and we need to invest uh, more in uh, what uh, has been probably abandoned uh, as a, a, a health uh, policy. Um, we've, we've heard about inequity, and uh, 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 inequity is a, a huge problem. Um, COVID-19 has uh, uh, shown us once again that uh, uh, health inequity, uh, overall inequities, but specifically health uh, inequities uh, kill. And uh, a lack 
of investment in uh, health generation and an excess of investment in uh, uh, health problems re to be repaired. Um, in other words, um, we need to, to uh, invest more in our social determinants of health and uh, communication, risk communication, uh, is a, a very important health determinant um, to try to get people involved in uh, maintaining their health um, uh, uh, and not just uh, uh, viewing health uh, systems as, uh, well, I, I, I get ill and I got to go to repair such uh, uh, damage. Um, transparency is uh, very, very important. And uh, what we've done, um, having daily uh, press conferences has been very important. Um, in the, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, we started giving uh, a big uh, uh, um, epidemic profile of the epidemic of the pandemic in in Mexico. And uh, as we've been going through time, we've we've changed the the language, we've changed the messages, and we now get like. 10 to 15 minutes or, or less um, to give uh, what's the profile on the epidemic in Mexico. And the rest of the hour, um, we try to make some uh, messages on uh, culture and COVID, um, the basic uh, preventive measures. We try to say them every day. Um, just like uh, uh, we've heard about uh, uh, the use of masks, specifically in close uh, uh, facilities uh, and, uh, and the lack of uh, uh, chance of having uh, physical distance between people. Um, and uh, uh, we've, we've uh, uh, introduced uh, different uh, themes uh, uh, that uh, we believe that it is uh, uh, very important uh, for people to know. You know, um, uh, health promotion is not uh, just giving messages and pamphlets and uh, uh, social uh, media uh, posts. Um, health promotion is to empower uh, society to get them to know their their rights to get them to know their risks their sanitary risks and show them how to manage such risks to maintain their health and to uh, recover from uh, illnesses once they're uh, they have uh, uh, been placed I think that uh, 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 what we heard uh, uh, a few minutes ago about the uh, SDGs is very, very important. And uh, probably uh, um, the SDG number three that it's called health uh, is more illness than health. And the rest of the SDGs are really about health, about uh, um, uh, clean water, about uh, climate change. And uh, we need to, to take COVID-19 pandemic as uh, uh, an important call to invest more in um, maintaining health uh than in repairing the damage 
And I think that COVID-19 has uh, uh, given us the opportunity to, to think, to rethink what we have and uh, to rethink that, uh, uh, to rethink what we need. And uh, what we need is solidarity, uh, national solidarity, yes, but international solidarity also. Um, that's why uh, Mexico in the UN uh, uh, General Assembly um, asked for, for a position that uh, um, medical countermeasures or health countermeasures such as uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine uh, would be uh, viewed as a, a public uh, well um, and that uh, we need to uh, make an equitable um, access for all because uh, what we learned in the 2009 pandemic is that uh, uh, money can buy many many things and uh, money bought the opportunity of uh, disseminating the um, the vaccine the h1n1 vaccine with more uh, uh, equity uh, and uh, what we learned is that uh, uh, countries that paid more and bought more got more vaccine and uh, they got the uh, earlier and that's uh, uh, a mistake that we cannot allow uh, to be done again so um, we need to communicate uh, more with society um, we need uh, uh, to uh, take this opportunity uh, that COVID-19 gave us to put into the the center of our decisions, the people and not the uh, institutions, not the countries, but the people uh, in uh, international uh, uh, community. So uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation and uh, uh, this is how I close, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Cortez Alcala, and thank you for reminding us about Mexico's contribution in the security of uh, approving the, the fact that the technology related to COVID-19 uh, are public goods. And I have two questions for you. Um, the first one, of course, Mexico is a federal country. Uh, how is collaboration across the different states of the federation in the fight against the pandemic? This is question number one. And the second one, you quite correctly have underlined the fact that health promotion is to empower society. But we would like your comments to tell us a little bit your ideas on how to build better health systems that are more resilient, people-centered and sustainable, and how to shift on keeping people healthy and not just to treat them when they are sick. You have the floor, Dr. Cortez Alcala. Thank you very much, Dr. Sotelo. Uh, Mexico, uh, as a federal country, uh, we have uh, different health authorities. Uh, president is one health authority uh, within the uh, federal secretary of, of uh, uh, health. Uh, but we have also other 32 um, health authorities, the state uh, governors. Um, what we've done is to put in place uh, basic federal um, um, guidelines uh, to, to share with the rest of, uh, of the country. Um, and, and why is that? Because we recognize that uh, state governors and state uh, health uh, uh, secretaries, they know better than us their territory. And we need to put in place basics from the federal uh, level 
uh, and then the state uh, uh, authorities must uh, um, uh, get to know such guidelines and make them operative in the territory, in the local territory. Um, I think that one of the best uh, um, tools that we've developed is the, the um, risk, uh, epidemic risk traffic light uh, uh, tool. Um, we have 10 indicators that are measured from the federal uh, government with the, um, the data that uh, uh, the local authorities and the local uh, epidemic surveillance uh, uh, personnel uh, give us in, in the online system uh, for, for uh, uh, respiratory disease surveillance. And uh, with those 10 um, indicators, uh, we designed a, a green, yellow, orange, and red uh, uh, light uh, uh, risk, uh, epidemic risk. And uh, that uh, uh, risk has been, or that tool has been taken uh, for all of the state governors with, with no importance of the color of the party um, in the federal government or in the local government. Um, we stay uh, closely in touch with state governors and state uh, uh, um, health secretaries. And uh, I think that um, uh, communication has been uh, the best that we can do. Um, it's, it's one of the most important issues is that we need to know that we can agree to disagree. And then when we, when we know that we can agree to disagree, then we can talk about uh, 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 how to manage uh, such disagreements. Um, this this uh, tool has uh, helped us uh, uh, having such uh, uh, communication with uh, state uh, uh, local authorities. And we also have the Mexican uh, um, uh, health municipalities uh, network um, uh, that uh, we have uh, um, different uh, uh, communication with uh, uh, the the mayors that that manage local cities and. Uh, with with that communication, we've been uh, uh, having less trouble on uh, implementing uh, other uh, strategies such as uh, um, uh, primary health care uh, for COVID-19. Um, on the other question, um, how to keep people healthy? Well, uh, I, I think uh, that uh, the major um, population, we, we um, born healthy, okay? And we have parents that should know how to keep us healthy. And then we need to, to keep growing on a, on a healthy environment. And that's what's being lost uh, um, having healthy environments. Um, public health policies are, uh, or healthy policies, not just in the Secretary of Health, but uh, having other policies uh, with a vision that uh, has been also lost, uh, health in all policies. Um, our new um, uh, uh, how, how do you say in, in, in English the Estado uh, uh, Frontal de Advertencia on, on, on um, um, the food package labeling, the, our new health package uh, labeling. It's a, a great uh, example on how we've lost uh, uh, the, the, the path of having healthy environments. 
um, you know, you can have two products on the same uh, um, the same products but different. The one uh, uh, it says uh, uh, with less sodium, but with the new um, labeling, both products have excess of sodium labeling. So how can a product that says as a healthy statement, this has less sodium, still have a, a, a label of excess of sodium? It's because, yes, it has less sodium, but compared with what? With this other product that it's probably 50% um, of uh, salt in, in their components. And uh, the, this new labeling has uh, um, shown us that uh, transparency is uh, uh, one of the uh, best ways on having a healthy environments. Uh, why is that? Because uh, once that you have the label, you 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 have all the the information to take decisions. I can have a, a product that has uh, excess of calories, sugars, sodium. I know now that such product has those excesses. Now it's my decision to, uh, uh, to have them uh, or to, to eat them. Um, before this new labeling, um, we took uh, products with uh, no chance of knowing probably what's the real deal in what we've uh, uh, taken and, and having uh, uh, to, to eat. And uh, such uh, um, healthy policies um, empower society to take decisions, to take better decisions. Um, we need to build a, a health system that uh, empowers people to take healthier decisions, to get to go to the healthcare center um, more when we are healthy than we when, than when we get ill. So um, primary healthcare and getting into the the ground, going uh, house by house, asking uh, how they are, um, <clears throat> because uh, uh, we've asked people to stay at home because of the COVID nineteen. Then we can get into the territory and go uh, uh, house by house, asking uh, and giving. Uh, information on how to take care uh, um, uh, for COVID-19 and getting the chance of having other basic public health programs in place like uh, hepatitis C uh, uh, screening um, because we have now a, a national hepatitis C elimination plan um, and we get uh, uh, and we get free treatment to all people that get uh, uh, a positive test. So primary health care and getting into the territory are the best ways to build a healthier population and a better uh, health system with more investment on um, human resources and, uh, uh, and and building health. Uh, not just uh, um, repairing the damage. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cortez Alcala. Uh, and please, I, I would beg all of you to remain until the end of the session, huh? because we will have uh, further opportunities for us to discuss. Now, I would like to invite our next speaker is Dr. Luis Guillermo Solis. Um, Professor, diplomat, and politician. President Luis Guillermo Solis Rivera served as president of Costa Rica from 2014 to 2018. In 
1984, he began his service in the foreign ministry, leading Costa Rica delegation to the United Nations, to the OAS and the European Union. He was the country's ambassador for Central America Affairs, and for two decades, he held the office of Secretary General of the Governing National Liberation Party, PLN. In uh, 1984, he played a key role in drafting the Stipulas II Accords aimed at riding the region of its frequent civil wars and signed by Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Costa Rica's then president, Oscar Arias Sanchez, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work on the accord. In 2005, uh, President Solis left the PLN to join the Citizen Action Party. Uh, President Solis is a graduate of the University of Costa Rica and has a master's degree in political science and sociology from Tulane University. With 30 years as an educator, he has also taught at the U University of Michigan and in 1999 was a Fulbright Scholar at Florida International University. He has published more than 10 books and dozens of articles for professional journals. Uh, President Solis, we are witnessing waves of protest in many places in the world for different reasons, since lack of opportunities, protests against racism, against policy brutality, among other reasons, how can be instrumented good public policies to make us better citizens and to reduce social tensions? President Solis, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sotelo. Uh, greetings to all. I would like to thank you for inviting me to this important conference and also uh, thank my colleague panelists for what has been already a very interesting conversation. I would like to, to start my remarks saying that I will defer my absolute support to what Dr. Ullman is going to say next, because ECLAC, CEPAL, has been the, at the forefront of the analysis of socioeconomic impacts of COVID in the Americas, and I'm sure that Dr. Ullman, her team, Dr. Barson, as the head of uh, ECLAC, of CEPAL, um, uh, have been working very hard and doing a great job on this. So I'm not going to refer to the economic and social implications, but rather take a look at politics. And as the question has uh, proposed, uh, public policies uh, and leadership, political leadership is, is very important. And it has been mentioned several times throughout our, this morning, but we always do it in an indirect way. And I would like to, to grasp this directly uh, and, and talk about politics and about the victimization of politics, just as it has happened with so many other things uh, with, with the pandemic. In the, last, in the last few years, we've seen really a number of, of dysfunctions in, in political life in, throughout the Americas, not only Latin American and the Caribbean. We are, we are seeing it in the United States as well as the campaign uh, develops, the presidential campaign develops. Um, and, and the pandemic, what, what, what the pandemic has done is actually unveiled a series of these functions, as I mentioned, um, throughout the, the political systems in the region, uh, because it came at the, at the end of a cycle uh, of, of incredulity, of uh, disbelief, of uh, severe criticisms to what we thought was uh, democracy at last uh, in the 1990s. And we've seen a number of criticisms uh, regarding lack of representation weak participation, the exclusion of large social sectors of our population, including, as it has been mentioned today, uh, people with disabilities, discapacidades. I would like to bring forth the whole uh, idea of, uh, of Alzheimer's and other dementia patients, for example, uh, who are uh, triply uh, segregated as a result of this, but in political terms, uh, the exclusion of socially vulnerable groups women, black populations, indigenous population, that was always uh, also occurring, uh, all, all occurring before the pandemic. The default of traditional political parties, people not feeling associated 
to those political parties and seeking other organizations of uh, communal order or, or local order rather than national political parties uh, to, to engage with. Uh, the two major uh, problems that I find, I, I will come to this back, uh, back to this in a little while, fragmentation and polarization that we've seen through the region and weak institutions, weakening institutions, the loss of authorities from everybody, from political leaders, from religious leaders, from business leaders, from union leaders, um, the whole issue of who rules and who has the capacity to convene the national will is at risk. And obviously a lot of, um, of anger triggered by corruption, lack of transparency, and of course, uh, in the incapacity to respond to demands, which is a growing trend throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, second, the pandemic has, has proven the need to have solid public institutions. Don't get me wrong, I am all in favor for public and private partnerships. I think that they're great and without those partnerships, we're not, a, we're not going to be able to overcome this thing. But, but I think that strong institutions, and particularly health care institutions, public, state-run, are essential. Um, I, I, I will dare say that uh, public social security institutions are the cornerstone of social peace in any country. And what I see throughout the region is very weak institutions in general and very, very weak health institutions, health systems in, in particular. Um, and of course, these institutions are necessary to neutralize fear, which is a big enemy of democracy, uh, to deal with violence, to uphold the preeminence of science. This was said by, by several of our panelists today. We, we have to uphold and support scientific evidence um, and to demonstrate viability, the viability of democracy um, as the best alternative to authoritarian rule, which throughout Central America and the Caribbean, and now particularly, uh, I would say, uh, in the whole hemisphere, given the, what we've seen in the United States over the past few months, uh, is necessary to, to, to remember. We have to, we need solid institutions, a rule of law that uh, is, is capable to, to withstand the actions of, of opportunistic forces, and of course, to ensure the application of health protocols. Uh, so, so this combination of political leadership on the one hand and institutional capacity on the other hand, I find essential. Um, and unfortunately, differently from what we're seeing in the developed world, uh, in the United States, the, the economic recovery seems to, to be moving phenomenally these last few, few weeks. I mean, we've seen records at Wall Street every day uh, moving ahead in Latin America, the impact, the economic impact of COVID is, is going to be long lasting and that is having political repercussions because in order to withstand the uh, economic crisis, um, governments have had to become more indebted, have become, are, are, are losing ground in terms of GDP growth uh, and they will require to fasten not less uh, the pace for deep and innovative political reforms that have been, uh, that had remained uh, in, the, in, the, in the back burner for a long, long time. Reforms that will be undoubtedly resisted by the dominant groups and, uh, and uh, that, that will, um, are not willing to undertake those reforms. This whole issue uh, that we were hearing about, solidarity, the uh, Secretary General Guterres' call for solidarity, is something that we're, we're missing so uh, in, the, in this message. Uh, and unfortunately, the gaps, the democratic gaps, uh, are not filling with more democratic actions, but with authoritarian trends. And this is something very uh, much to be to be concerned about, particularly because the more authoritarian the political regimes get, the more violence and the more disorder we are we are going to face. And then, of course, Latin America and the Caribbean will face a very complicated electoral cycle in the next couple of years. We have two elect, three elections in 2020, Bolivia, Venezuela, and the United States of different order. Some are uh, midterm, some are presidential. We have eight elections in 2021, 
and we have two elections in 2022, Brazil and Colombia, making the region to go through 12 elections in, 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 in two years. So this is, is, this is trouble. So let me finalize by saying that for me, the gravest threats for political rule and democratic development in Central America and Latin America and the Caribbean as a result of COVID have to do with fragmentation of the polity. I mean, their societies have exploded in, in a series of divergent directions. Secondly, polarization uh, that, that is being even furthered by the language and the um, overall behavior of, of, of political leaders uh, and the existing preconditions, never be better said, given that this is a health uh, conference, the pre-existing conditions in Latin America leading towards authoritarianism. Uh, unfortunately, I am not uh, optimistic about what we will see in the next few years, particularly because of this ongoing cycle of crisis that the region is going to go through. But I continue to be a strong believer in democracy, a strong believer in the rule of law on market economics uh, with solidarity for the solution of this, which, as Guterres said, uh, uh, yeah, some some months ago, is an issue that will be solved. We'll be able to solve it, but it's going to hurt. It will continue to be hurting, and uh, and the political the political class uh, will continue to be responsible for the handling of the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Solis. You have uh, underlined the fact that we are living in a fragmented. Uh, society. Now, I have a related question for you. Uh, so, if we agree that society is fragmented um, to to high extent disconnected, you know, groups and groups of population, the poor, the rich, and so on. They live in different places, they work in different settings, they go to different services. Uh, so, uh, there is a high proportion of informal economy also in Latin America and the Caribbean, with segments of the population without any social protection. How to move forward? Uh, we have heard of a new uh, of the need for a new social contract. How this could be attained? You have gave us some ideas about communication, some ideas about institutions, about a, a leadership that is changing, but uh, I would like to go a little bit further. How this uh, new social contract could be uh, attained? What can what else can we do? Uh, thank you so much, uh, President Solis, for your ideas. I, I invite you to, to share with us some more thoughts on that. Yes, thank you, Dr. Fotero. I think that uh, we are, many countries are going through this uh, discussion in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, how to frame a new social contract uh, and how to do it in the, the right way, which is through democratic uh, debates, um, not through the usual, you know, uh, coup d'etat sol solution, which is the way out that in the past was, was generally used. I think that one element, one key element is the willingness to have a national dialogue. We have to find uh, spaces of dialogue where we can uh, meet uh, the problem with polarization is that those uh, that the repopulation of of national dialogues is being very difficult. But without the willingness of bringing all sectors into the debate, uh, it is going to be very difficult to recreate a social contract. I mean, how do you do that if you don't have enough women making decisions and partaking with men, not only in politics, but also in the economy? One in every four women in the United States, according to a McKenzie uh, report that was just released uh, a few days ago, are out of, out of their jobs because of COVID, because they have to take the traditional women take uh, caretaker role in their families. This is absurd. I mean, if you don't get more women, and, and remember all the problems we have with incorporating women into uh, the economy and other matters in Latin America, uh, we are not going to be able to, to go out uh, and, and, and recreate a, a social contract. So an inclusive dialogue with, with all the sectors and particularly those who have been uh, excluded. Uh, take the case of indigenous populations in the Andean region or in the indigenous populations in Guatemala and Mexico. How to get them into that dialogue, understand uh, where they're coming from, what kind of needs they have, what kind of institutions 
uh, they have to to have and in, in what ways they can contribute with their ancestral knowledge. So national dialogues are inclusive. Secondly, I think it is necessary to uh, make the rules even. Um, I'm not, as I said, in favor of, uh, of state-controlled uh, economies. I believe in an economy of the market. But unless uh, there are some regulations of that market, the market is going to exclude more people than incorporate them into, into the discussion. And this is why uh, fair taxation regimes that are progressive, uh, not regressive, uh, the idea of public institutions, like especially in health, in education, uh, in, in housing, are so essential so that we can raise the level of the bottom quintiles of, of, of the social structure. So progressive social policies that will help the market to revamp itself. Uh, thirdly, I think we, we need international solidarity. I find only natural that we are what we're seeing, which is every country trying to take everything to itself. But natural is not necessarily correct. And I am all in favor of more multilateral actions and all in favor of more support from those countries that are going to recuperate faster for, uh, with re regards to those that are still in the hole. So, you know, uh, more, uh, better, better finance, uh, social policies. That's a third element. And fourthly, I think there, it is a need, there is a need for legal reforms as well, because we have crafted regimes that are just all to the contrary to those uh, needs that we have now. The political regimes are exclusive with laws that prevent the inclusion of people into decision-making processes and the social and political structure are, are too stiff to deal with the kind of challenges that COVID and other pandemics in the future will bring about. Uh, thank you, President Solis, for this fantastic uh, roadmap that you have uh, drawn for us. Um, certainly, pose as a challenge for the future, and that we have to address them with a matter of urgency. Now, I will. I would like to invite uh, Heidi Ullman, uh, our last panelist. Uh, Heidi Ullman, she serves as the health specialist in the Social Development Division of ECLAC, that's the United Nations Economic. Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, better, better well known as CEPAL in, in, in the region. This entails conducting quantitative research on health disparities and health systems in Latin America and the Caribbean. Her main areas of work include child, adolescent, and youth health and nutrition, sexual and reproductive health, and linkages between social protection and health. As part of her duties, Heidi leads technical cooperation activities to support ECLAC member states on statistical and policy issues, particularly pertaining to health and health systems. She has also provided technical assistance on policies related to the situation of persons with disabilities and to children, adolescents, and youth. Heidi holds a master's degree in public health from Columbia University and a PhD in public and international affairs with an emphasis in demography and from Princeton University. Heidi, we are all looking forward to learn from you, but uh, before you comment, I would like to stress that your institutional capacity where you are located, your current locus at ECLA, you are working with many disparities in Latin America uh, that the region is facing. I would like your comments on how metrics on inequalities and opportunities, uh, access to health services, education of, of quality, capacity to respond to disasters like the one the world is facing now, especially in the Americas. Uh, you have the floor and tell, tell us please about how, how this could be uh, well expressed and how this could be measured, okay? So you have the floor, Heidi. Thank you very much, Dr. Sotelo. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this uh, seminar. Uh, I, of course, transmit the warm greetings of Alicia Barcena, the Executive Secretary of ECLAC, and her sincere regret that she couldn't participate in person in this space. 
And um, I just wanted to begin by saying that I think my presentation and Mark's uh, dovetail very nicely with what was presented uh, before me. And, and my comments will sort of help to, to land or to contextualize the three previous presentations to the Latin America and Caribbean context with concrete figures and metrics. We know, of course, that um, the access to information is absolutely critical in order to better understand uh, the reality of what's going on and to also craft uh, these informed uh, in evidence. Uh, and the region has advanced in important ways uh, in different um, collection instruments, collection instruments, but there's still a long way to go, particularly if we are to think of disaggregated data that will allow us to reveal and fully understand that impacts people in the region according to their sex, their racial and ethnic identification, disability status, migrations, uh, and other key uh, determinants of inequality in the region. We know that uh, the pandemic arrives in a region that was all uh, seeing a very complex situation in terms of its economics, in terms of, of its social development, of course, uh, as well in issues of social discontent. There were already increases in poverty and extreme poverty that were being anticipated, uh, levels of income inequality, uh, deterioration in labor uh, market indices these indicators in the labor market uh, and I know that uh, the, the the social protection and health systems in the region uh, are fragmented uh, so all of this has created a very uh, vulnerable and uh, delicate situation for the region to face the pandemic um, the most, most recent ECLAC uh, figures point to reduction in the um, GDP growth of nine uh, 0.1% at the regional level with some variation among countries, uh, and also increases in poverty in around 37%, as well as increases in unemployment around 35%. Uh, and we also know that income inequality, as measured by the Gini Index, uh, will also increase in this time period familiar with Latin America understands that inequality is a historical characteristic of our region, unfortunately. Uh, it is a characteristic that has been made and even reproduced, in, in, including in periods where there has been uh, e economic prosperity. Consider, for example, that between 2002 and 2017, in the Gini, uh, there was an improvement in the Gini from about comma three comma six, uh, which is important. And this improvement in the income distribution in that period of time can be relating to movements in the labor market. So from uh, decreases in unemployment, uh, this is labor force participation. Uh, and also of particular importance was an improvement in the income received among those uh, at the lower income distribution, owing uh, a lot to the fact that there was an expansion of education opportunities uh, across the income distribution. Um, um, recent inequality in this period of time also had to do with improvements in the minimum wage uh, and also uh, in countries in particular particular thinking program in Brazil and uh, uh, Progresa or previously Oportunidades program in Mexico to transfers, transfers to poorer households. So owing to all of this uh, situation, we see that there was an improvement in income inequality in that time period. Unfortunately, um, I share uh, Dr. Um, Solis's um, less than positive or optimistic um, outlook uh, for uh, the region in the coming decade. Uh, and this is something that concerns ECLAC, not only the impact that pandemic will have on inequality today, but also the way in which uh, the pandemic is so the, the roots for inequality in the future, particularly relating to areas 
of human capacity development in the long term. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on three uh, areas Areas, one education, nutrition. Uh, so just to give you an idea, there has been a lot of improvement in the region in terms of education access. Consider, for example, that in 2002, about 48% of people 20 to 24 years of age had completed their secondary education. When we look at that figure again, 18, it's risen to almost 70%. So this is a very uh, dramatic improvement over the course of 16 years, which not only the possibility of young people to access decent work in the labor market, but related to Dr. Solis's point, also thinking about an educated population as one that is uh, better informed and more active citizens and participants in the democratic process uh, and therefore strengthening institutions as well. However, we also know that there are deep uh, inequalities in access to uh, education, secondary education. So that same figure that I gave you about second edition completion. Well, in 2018, only 44% of males in the lowest pile completed secondary education, even at the level of the average that was 16 years ago. Whereas young women uh, in the richest uh, income quintile complete secondary education, about 92% of them do. Um, so, and if we look at the data also for tertiary education, which is increasingly important important given the labor market, we also see very important gaps about only one in five uh, people, 25 to 29 in the region today, complete tertiary education. And this figure only reaches 3.5% of young men in the poorest income quintile. So there have been advances. Uh, there are also deep uh, inequalities um, in this indicator that, as I said, has a, a very important for a future labor market and participation as active members of the society. In the context of COVID, we know that schools have had to close. Uh, this has affected over 60 million students in the region. And this is at all levels. And in addition to interrupting their educational trajectories, the closing of school has an impact for uh, nutrition as many students, particularly those from poorer households, access uh, food and nutrition through school feeding, many of which fortunately have uh, managed to stay open, uh, but also other important services such as uh, mental health and psychosocial uh, support in the schools and uh, services and information regarding sexual and reproductive health. So the closing of schools uh, is a very, very big concern. And even though um, activities have been able to uh, continue online through diverse um, technological tools, we all know that this pandemic has exposed a great digital divide that exists. So in Latin America, only 46% of children five to 12 live in households that connection to the internet. Um, and so this obviously is, uh, this is an average and again, here we see very important uh, disparities between income levels. This figure reaches almost 80% in students uh, who have richer households, but is closer to a percent of students who live in the poorer households. And when we talk about the digital divide uh, in, in the context of the pandemic and of uh, education and dissing, it's not only an issue of binary has access, doesn't have access, but also the quality of that access and also having the skills that the students parents have the skills to uh, support that distance learning and we know that that is also lacking uh, in vulnerable households so this um, increases our very deep concern that the gaps that we had already seen in uh, learning um, and in skills development will only only uh, be in in terms of uh, in in the context of this pandemic as a result of this pandemic with long lasting implications for the development of the region. The second do with um, with nutrition. Um, we know that uh, in a few months, the course uh, the region had progressed quite a bit in areas of nutrition of malnutrition. 
um, with great reductions in some countries. And we know that the risk of being lost uh, due to the pandemic, uh, we estimate from ECLAC that extreme poverty in the region will reach 83 over 80 uh, people. Uh, and so these are uh, people that cannot even satisfy their most basic needs. Uh, and this is also in 2018, it was already estimated that 53.7 uh, million people uh, suffered from uh, food insecurity. So in thinking about cognitive development, in thinking about pregnant women uh, who are just and the impacts that uh, this de deficient have on the long term, uh, this is also an important source of concern. And finally, in, in the area of health, uh, we all already know that prior to the pandemic, there were also very uh, deep inequalities relating to health outcomes and access to health services. For, um, we know that even though the, the um, belonging to or having health insurance uh, uh, increased for uh, those who, who had um, jobs um, in the formal market uh, between 2002 and 2006 um, were particularly um, observed in the lower income quintiles, there's still a 37 percentage gap between access to health insurance between the lowest and the highest income quintiles. And, uh, and thinking about the impacts uh, term, so if we have all these uh, people entering poverty or vulnerable to poverty, uh, what are the social determinants of health perspective, what impacts health impacts in the long term of having this situation? So this is also something that is uh, of concern to us. And in the context of the pandemic, it's important to mention also the issue of mental health. Tomorrow is the World Mental Health Day. Uh, we know that there are people who had mental health issues before the pandemic who uh, now are seeing that access interrupted. Uh, but of course, also so people who are developing uh, issues relating to mental health uh, and the impacts that that can have in, uh, in the long term uh, for people and for the development of the region. And a final area of inequality that I was concerned about in deepening in the context of the pandemic relates to gender-based um, disparities. So not only relating uh, the increased demands that they are uh, experiencing due to the non-paid home and care work that was mentioned by Dr. Solis. So in terms of uh, the region already having very low female uh, labor force participation rates that had been increasing, but they are still low given the level of development and particularly the level of education reached by women um, in these most recent generations. And uh, the concern now that makes the labor market uh, due to uh, the impacts of the pandemic uh, and also of course, the issues that have been raised uh, regarding violence. So uh, returning to the original question posed by Dr. Sokolo about metrics, uh, I, I hope that I've did some evidence. Um, the, the concerns that ECLAC has about the potential uh, that this situation is not only creating a worsening of, of inequality in the present moment, but also the potential impact through the pathway of human and uh, capability city development in the long term. Um, and I would close my remarks there. Thank you, Dr. Ulman, for, for your uh, comments. Uh, uh, and you provide us a very relevant landscape of disabilities and, and disparities in the region. And you have uh, give us a, a close look of the long term also. And I have... Uh, Two, two questions for you, uh, Dr. Ulman. Uh, number one, I would like to have some uh, comments from you about official, de official development assistance, ODA, which was already falling before the pandemic, and I understand this is worse now. And the uh, other question is related to international cooperation. Uh, we know this is vital, and we have uh, talked about multilateral efforts a lot in this panel. 
but uh, like the joint effort uh, and report done by ECLA and Pajo about uh, inputs for leaders uh, facing political pressures to put the health of the citizens first. Uh, there is a fatigue in the population. Now uh, people are, you know, wanting to open the economy and some leaders also. What can we do from the UN about this, this situation, this fatigue that the population is having on this uh, situation that the world is living? And thank you again for the good report that uh, ECLA and PAHO have prepared regarding the economy and health in the pandemic. You have the floor, Dr. Ullman. very much, uh, Dr. Sotelo, for those questions. So first, I would say that the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean and are suffering from the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis through at least five pathways. First, clearly, there is a fall in trade with their main trade partner, international global level. There are uh, lowered prices in the basic commodities on which many economies of the region depend, interruption in, in um, the chains and also uh, for particularly Caribbean countries, Central American countries are reduced in the demand uh, for tourism. And as a result of the global economic crisis, also a reduction in uh, remittances, which are a, a, an important um, source of income, um, especially in more vulnerable households, uh, but also uh, for some economies. Uh, as a whole. Uh, so in this context, it's important uh, from ECLAC's view that, um, that measures be taken immediately to increase uh, fiscal space to finance development, uh, finance investments uh, in human capacity um, building and resilience so that we don't see very dramatic effects uh, in the long uh, in, in order really to safeguard the the advances that have been seen in the in in these areas uh, over the the past uh, few years. so this is a, a key issue the uh, the issue of increasing fiscal space but obviously there there is a very complex economic situations so about how that can be done um, is is a challenge um, as you mentioned the over uh, the ODA overseas, uh, official, I'm sorry, development uh, assistance uh, has decreased. I um, mean, in, in 2018, uh, it was reduced uh, uh, 4%. Uh, and for the least developed countries, it, it contracted 2.2%. Uh, and so it is important for ODA. The issue for uh, many countries, some countries in the region, is that they've graduated beyond the income is to be considered for uh, considered DA. So uh, ECLAC is proposing that uh, the international financial institutions uh, flexibilize a little bit and make uh, financing available to countries of the region, especially thinking about the Caribbean countries that are not only uh, dealing with uh, the COVID crisis, but they also have issues relating uh, to uh, a large debt uh, that they have to service, and also the issue of uh, climate-related disasters that really uh, creates a, a difficulty for them uh, in order to find space to uh, find finance for development, to uh, invest in infrastructure and make investments in human capacity development. So ECLAC is proposing uh, five recommendations. Uh, one has to do with debt alleviation, particular, uh, it has to do with the paralyzation or, or stopping of, of uh, debt servicing. Um, also, as I mentioned, this issue of flexibilizing uh, the, the requirements of the international financial institution, uh, creating different kinds of bonds, can see bonds, blue bonds, green bonds that can help uh, not only um, invest in some of of these uh, invest in some of these areas relating to a greenery uh, and also um, sort of helping uh, the countries with uh, liquidity issues. So I think that that um, are some of the issues. And uh, to your point, uh, I think that this is not only going to be a long 
lasting impact of the COVID crisis on uh, the continent, on the societies in Latin America and the Caribbean, but it's also going to be one that is non-lineal. Like as we've seen in the country of Europe that uh, sort of over the first wave and then managed to open, uh, reopen some of their economic activities and social, uh, in the social area as well. Uh, seeing uh, again uh, uh, increases in their cases, and as you've said, uh, there is a lot of resistance from the population to uh, to. And so, this for the Latin American countries and Caribbean countries, it generates a very complex situation for the governments in deciding and creating what this balance is between the reopening the economy and the health. And what we try to propose in that ECLAB a joint ECLAS PAHO document that is a completely false dichotomy. And it, they cannot be thought of uh, in such separate ways because any uh, measure to open the economy will have an effect uh, on the health of the population and could imply an even uh, more serious setback. And so those uh, pressures have to be very carefully in determining uh, what the next course is and the message fundamentally message from the document was that the health, the health of the population is what should be guiding uh, the decisions to uh, reopen, even though those decisions may not, as you say, be very popular and, uh, and may um, be met with a lot of resistance. Um, but to support uh, sort of the population's ability to it to some of those uh, measures of the social distancing measures. ECLAC has also proposed a series of, um, of, of policies or programs that could help. For example, uh, the population, uh, we know that over 50% of the population in Latin America and the Caribbean works in the infrastructure, and this is clearly uh, a challenge for this uh, part of the population to generate income due to the social uh, confinement and sensing measures. So uh, obviously one uh, proposal that I, I think is, is well known to everyone by now is the basic social uh, income, basic emergency income, uh, which would be equivalent to uh, one, of, one of the poverty line, amount of poverty line in the country uh, for a duration period of six months. Um, and reaching uh, the whole population in in poverty situation, which would reach 215 million people. Uh, another proposal to help the, the population sort of adhere more closely to the climate and social distancing measures uh, at the lower end of the income spectrum obviously has to do with um, and against hunger, so also uh, to uh, support uh, the lower the the households in the lower income quintiles uh, to uh, be able to maintain basic consumption, meet their basic needs, and finally uh, a, a more recent idea relating to the digital gap um, to be able to have uh, sort of support also to the lower income households regarding connection to internet and access to um, devices in order to be able to at least continue uh, the education trajectories of, of young ch of children in those households. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ullman. It has been a great session, but we are approaching now the end of, of our segment here. And I think we have only two members of the panel left. Uh, and I will ask uh, both Dr. Cortez and Dr. Uh, Ullman in a minute to tell us your final message uh, so we can close the panel immediately after you speak, okay? And I invite uh, Dr. Ricardo Cortez Alcalá to tell us in one minute your final thoughts about this matter. Thank you very much, Dr. Zotelo. Um, COVID-19 has left many, many uh, lessons learned. We need to take them seriously to shift in a different way uh, an overconsumption, um, an overconsumption, and, and uh, to take this opportunity to change 
our vision, as former President uh, Solis said, to change our vision into give health as a right and to make health systems, public health systems, more uh, a chance of investment and uh, to give um, more investment into health promotion and into um, social determinants of health and healthier um, policies. Thank you very much. Dr. Ullman. Thank you. Yes, the, the outlook is not very encouraging, but I think that we can take lessons from the past. Also, take this as an opportunity. Said many times that this, uh, and Dr. Cortez Alcala just mentioned the same idea that we can uh, learn lessons from this, back better, build back with more equality, build back in a way that is more sustainable. But that requires actions. So I think that governments really need to very seriously and think hard about what path they want to chart for their countries in the future. And this is also a regional question that requires regional cooperation and regional integration that we think together about the challenges that face Latin America and the Caribbean. The countries are very, very economically, socially, ling linguistically, <laughs> geographically, a lot of differences, but there are also some very, very similar shared challenges that cast uh, throughout greater regional cooperation, regional integration. So those would be my, my thoughts. Great. Thank you very much to Dr. Galvao and to the outstanding group of panelists. Uh, I, I'm very sure and confident that we have had great contributions to the social and public policy. This is a time of opportunity. And let's place public health in the driver's seat. Thank you so much. <laughs>